uh, thank you. This is a third in our in our series of special interest forums. Um, I have just a couple announcements off the top here before I hand it over to our moderator. Um, as we get started, uh, we will be taking uh, questions from our participants tonight. Uh, we ask that you remain muted um, until you have a question, and then you should see there is a raise hand button um, at the bottom of the participants window uh, in Zoom, and you can do that, and we can unmute you so you can ask your question. Alternatively, you can also click on the chat option and type your questions into the chat box. Uh, and we'll address all questions that are typed into the chat box as we move through tonight. Um, as you can see on the screen, our topic, inclusive education and inclusive communities. Um, and I'll hand it over to our moderator, Dr. Milberger. Thanks, Mike. So welcome everybody to our third um, in our series of special interest forums. As Mike mentioned, I um, am from the Michigan Developmental Disabilities Institute, or my DDI. And my DDI is what's called the University Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities, or a USED. And we are part of a national network of university centers. So in every state, in territory, there's at least one USED. So for the state of Michigan, the USED is housed at Wayne State University. And USEDs are federally mandated and, uh, through the Developmental Disabilities Act and funded through the US Department of Health and Human Services. Our mission is to contribute to the development of inclusive communities and quality of life for people with disabilities and their families. And we serve people with all types of disabilities across the lifespan and across the state and really the nation. And the reason for the forum is, is based on a premiere of the film, the documentary we showed, uh, had a premiere of last October at Wayne State University called Intelligent Lives. And the film follows three young adults with intellectual disabilities, and one of the adults featured in the film is Micah Fialka Feldman, who is uh, from Michigan and went to Berkeley High School. And his mother, Janice Fialka, is part of our LEND faculty. And I hope all of you have seen the film, and if you haven't, it's definitely worth seeing, and we can talk about ways that you can see that. And for those of you who have, that have seen the film, know that it addresses uh, many weighty topics and is very thought-provoking in some way raises more questions than answers. So in order to, uh, to do a deeper dive into some of these heavy topics, we've scheduled a series of these special interest forums. Uh, so this is the third in our series. The first two forums on intelligence testing and circles of support are available on, our, uh, on the MyDDI website. So this evening's topic is inclusive education and inclusive communities and this is a topic very near and dear to our hearts, of course, based on our mission. And we are lucky tonight to have three esteemed panelists who are joining us who are going to help us unpack this very important topic. And just real briefly, the format for our time together, we have an hour together. We have, um, I'll introduce our panelists in a moment. And each of them will have an opportunity to answer some questions and give a brief presentation. Uh, hopefully there can be some time for them to dialogue with each other. We'll share some resources with you and save some, a brief time at the end for you, for those of you listening in, to ask questions. And our panelists have agreed that if um, we don't have enough time, if there are a lot of questions and we don't have enough time to get to them all, you can write them into the, the chat section, you can email the questions, and we'll make sure those questions get posted and the answers to those questions also get posted on our website. So I'd like to introduce our three uh, presenters this evening. We have Dr. Jill England, who received her master's from Eastern Michigan University in speech and language pathology, and her PhD from the University of Michigan in educational psychology. Dr. England has worked as a speech therapist in the public schools and in a segregated center program for students with significant disabilities, and is a curriculum consultant for the Washtenaw Intermediate School District. She is currently a private consultant and provides training to families and schools throughout the country and internationally. Her areas of expertise include collaborative teaching, classroom-based related services, positive behavioral support, instructional strategies and accommodations, universal design and differentiated instruction, and including students with challenging educational needs. So we have got the expert here on inclusive education. I'm very thrilled about that. We also have with us Abby Loy. Um, who is a 26-year-old student attending Washtenaw Community College and is pursuing a career in childcare. She started her education, her formal education in Montessori School, 
and has attended only regular education classes in the public school system. At Brighton High School, she earned her varsity letter as a member of the chorus and the at clarinetist in the marching and wind symphony dance. Abby serves her community by giving presentations on Down syndrome to educators, physicians, civic organizations, and decision makers across the state. She also works at First Steps Preschool and the Head Start program in Brighton. And Abby also is um, one of the, um, uh, we, my DDI has a series of videos called Possibilities. And Abby is one of the stars in one of our videos. We'll give you the link to that. But that's a great way to get to know more about Abby because there's a lot to know about you, Abby. And also for those of you that were at the premiere of Intelligent Lives, Abby was one of our panelists following in the discussion that we had after the film. So welcome, Abby, and happy you're here. Uh, and we also have with us Luann Loy, who um, has worked with her husband, Mike, there's Luann, um, to ensure a quality education for all three of their children. In the early 1990s, they co-founded the Inclusive Education Network of Livingston County. Luann is a graduate of the first class of Michigan's Partners in Policymaking, serves as a member of DDI's um, Community Advisory Council, and is the president of the Livingston Educational Service Agency's Board of Education. So welcome presenters. And I'd like to start with you, Dr. England. And I um, would like to see if you could um, Share with us, what are the benefits of inclusion in regular classrooms and in the community, and who benefits? And Jill, and Dr. England, you're on, there you go. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm back on the good. <laughs> I thought I had uh, frozen up there. Glad the te technical. Uh, okay. Um, for the benefits, I made a slide. So can I go to the slide presentation now, or? Yes, go ahead and share your slide deck. I knew that was one of the questions. So um, what I did was I put together a little slide presentation and I tried to do it relatively quickly. Um, but I put it, divided it into the benefits because I knew you were going to ask me about those and the supports that make an inclusion successful, accommodations, and planning. So I have a few slides on each one. But the benefits I put into this slide, and I think we have... Uh, a handout that's available, the Inclusive Education Research and Practice from Maryland Coalition for Inclusive Education. Do you have that that can be sent to participants? Yes. Yeah, okay. It's excellent. It's a little bit old. It's 2010, but it really goes over these, these same things, and it's very well written and has all the references. So one of the benefits of inclusive education is the opportunities to model and learn from peers. Um, when, let, let's just assume you have difficulty with speech and language, if you're in a special education classroom and all of the children are struggling with speech and language, you don't really have that opportunity to model after peers that have more, are more competent in their language. But as well as behavior, as well as learning activities, those opportunities to learn from peers really are important. Then there's also the opportunity to learn from content experts. Unfortunately, our special ed teachers often had to teach mathematics, social studies, language arts, many subjects to a group of students, um, especially if students were in a categorized classroom. When we do inclusion, then the students are out in the regular classrooms with the support from the special ed teachers, and they're learning from the context, content experts. So clearly, they're gonna have better achievement if they're getting math taught by math teachers that specialize in math, or history teachers that specialize in history. There's also higher expectations of the teachers for students with disabilities. Um, increased achievement for students with and without disabilities. And we'll see a couple of examples of that on the slides. Increased graduation rates, particularly for students with learning disabilities. Uh, more and more of them are graduating from high school than before with regular diplomas. Improved behavior. Of course, increased participation in community. Um, work, leisure time, and living based on their activities, and I'll bet Abby has a lot of things to share about that particular benefit. Um, and increased positive uh, attitudes by families, teachers, and students with and without disabilities. I've done research in a couple of school districts where we've interviewed families afterwards and teachers and students, and 100% um, of them are in favor of inclusive education if done correctly if done with supports. 
So then there's also the development of long-term friendships. Those of you that saw the, uh, the, the movie, Intelligent Lives, will, saw lots of examples of uh, real friendships that lasted long-term uh, based on being included in the regular education settings. And then this one's important to administrators, that the cost of inclusive education is about the same as running the segregated program. This is not a hugely expensive uh, project. However, if they continue to try and run parallel programs, of course, you know, it's going to be more expensive. They need to move their resources over. So anyway, those are my short list of benefits. And did you want me to just go on with the effective practices, Sharon? Yes, please. Okay. So I divided these into just those three topics. But clearly, one of the most important things is having support in the classroom. Otherwise, we just have dumping children into regular rooms. And we know that doesn't work. One of the models is to have a special ed teacher go into the general education classroom and co-teach. And they can do that a variety of ways. They can teach the class, they can work with small groups, they can do individual support, they can provide materials and accommodations uh, for the general education teacher to use in the class. And I'll show you a couple of examples of this. This is uh, out in New Mexico, and we have two, two teachers in the room. And I like this slide because it's actually the special ed teacher that's at the board uh, uh, presenting the lesson to the students. And this is really important because when the special ed teachers move into co-teaching and inclusion, they do not just want to be sitting in the back of the room or uh, in charge of behavior control in the classroom. They want to be teachers still. And so by going into the classroom and having an equal role in the teaching, um, it's made it a really exciting thing for the uh, special ed teachers to do. This is just another example. This is middle school co-teaching, and this shows you a little bit of, of why there would be a benefit here, why there would be higher achievement for all the students. These are one special ed teacher, one general ed teacher, and all they've done is divide the class into two groups. They're teaching exactly the same content. It's a literature uh, class, and they're teaching about, uh, about a literature piece they've read. So it's the same lesson, but each of the groups, the children get more chances to participate, they get more questions answered, um, they get more individual attention. It's, this, it's called parallel teaching. And this is one of my favorites. This is um, also in, out in New Mexico, and this is an Algebra I class. And on the left side of the screen is the gentleman is the teacher, and on the right side is the co-teacher who helps students in the classroom and works with small groups. And here's one of the exciting things. After the first year of moving the students with learning disabilities out of the segregated math class into the regular education and Algebra I class, all of the students with disabilities passed the Algebra I class. In addition, the teacher told me that for the first time, all of his students passed this class. Before, he always had a couple of students that failed Algebra I. By having that co-teacher in there, that co-teacher helped all the students. It was just uh, more help for everybody. The other exciting part is the kids with learning disabilities, the young adults with learning disabilities. Um, he had never had anybody with a learning disability asked to take Algebra II, and this time two or three of the students wanted to move on in math um, and take, take a higher level math class. And then the other group of people that go into classes besides the special ed teachers are the speech therapists, the occupational therapist, occasionally the physical therapist. And in this case, this is a speech therapist, and you can see him teaching this, the whole group here in this um, uh, preschool program. But he also sits down and works with groups in the classroom, and he models for the teachers and the assistants in there the strategies he's using to help the students with their speech and language so that they can carry that on the rest of the day. We have many speech therapists around the country that are going into classrooms now rather than pulling children out. And then there's paraprofessionals support. This is Bradley Butler, and he had a paraprofessional uh, most of his years through school. She didn't uh, go to all the classes with him, and she never pulled up a chair and sat down at his desk, making him look, you know, stigmatized like he always had an adult sitting next to him. But one of the things I like about this particular slide is, this is a co-taught classroom. You can see the two teachers in the front of the room, and this is, so they're in this classroom, there are four or five students with learning disabilities. Uh, but because Bradley needed extra support, a paraprofessional also went into that classroom. 
and she helps other students in there too. So here's a co-taught classroom with a paraprofessional. And Abby, you might want to mention how you work with your paraprofessional here. Do you have something to share? I don't know. Well, I can, I can jump in here. Abby had a paraprofessional working in her classroom who originally was assigned to her, and then we convinced the school that the parapro should be assigned to the classroom and the teacher mm -hmm. uh, and provide supports to other students as well. And generally it worked out fairly well. And Abby did not have a parapro kind of Velcro to her side, um, which was great. That's the way it should be. There's one school in New York, there's a video, um, blanking on the name of it right now, but there's a video that has an example of paraprofessional working with a teacher. And the school is so large, and they have so many students with uh, disabilities, that the paraprofessional is able to stay with the teacher year after year. So a new child with a challenging need comes into the classroom, um, and that child moves on to the next grade level, but the parapro stays with the teacher. It's really a unique model. And, and it uh, works out very well. So, but mostly we don't have that, that many resources, so often pair pros kind of follow along with the student. So, anyway. Then there's another model, besides the co-teaching, there are many students, particularly kids with learning disabilities, uh, and mild, more mild impairments, that don't really need a co-teacher or a paraprofessional, but they just need con consultation to the team, and maybe materials preparation. And this particular example comes from the United Arab Emirates, where I spent like seven or eight years working. And this is the visually impaired consultant, who of course worked one-on-one -on -one with Ozma to learn to read and write Braille. Um, you know, we have some fantastic equipment now that, that you can write a story and it prints it out in Braille and it prints it out in English for the teacher to read, as you can see that example. Um, and of course, we print it in English or Arabic over there, but um, this teacher used English, so. So anyway, she first worked with Ozma to learn to read and write Braille. Then she went right into the classroom and still worked with Ozma in first grade. She's using her Perkins Braille over there. She'll move on to a computer uh, eventually. But she was using the Perkins Braille right there. So there's uh, the consultant in the classroom. But by second grade, Ozma actually was in the classroom independently. She didn't need uh, a pair of and, I, and again, I kind of like this classroom because I always hear from people how, oh, there's too many children in the classroom. We never could make inclusion work. The teacher will have too much to do. Look at the size of this classroom. Look how many children are in this room. And Ozma is very successfully included in here uh, without a, another adult in the room, without co-teaching and without a paraprofessional or consultant. I have a little video of her. Let's see if it plays. So let's go ahead and get started. Let me stop that for just a minute. Um, one of the most wonderful things, and again, Luann, you might be able to speak to this, or Abby also, but we really want the teacher, whether there's a parapro or not, we want the teacher to take ownership of the child. And I want you to listen to this teacher who treats uh, asthma like any other child in the classroom. Who can tell me what is the title of this book? Raise your hand. What is the title of this book? A beer? Yeah, and a uh, No? What is the title of the book? Jack and the Beanstalk. Yes. Jack and the Beanstalk. Yes? Asma, you need to be reading on your paper, please. Very good. All right? So, so there she is. Asma's goofing around, not paying attention, and the teacher you know, says, Asma, you need to be paying attention. Asma is her student. First student in the classroom, just as like any other student in the classroom. With the collaboration, one of the important things is to meet with the team, which includes the teachers, the parents often, the paraprofessionals, um, and they review the curriculum and what accommodations have to be, to be made. And of course, last week we had wonderful presentations on Circle of Friends and natural supports, and these are just some of the examples from kids that I have worked with in schools that I have worked with, but um, it's amazing. I'm, again, Abby, you might be able to speak to this, but it's amazing how students want to be helpful. I, I don't think I ever heard of a child with a disability who was included that was actually teased by other children. Ever. Ever. And that's often a fear of families. 
um, it usually works out exactly like you see in these pictures, where children are very supportive and helpful. Um, families, of course, are the other uh, critical support, and technology today has just been amazing. Now you get communications home, uh, parents get communications home on emails and on iPads, and so they're, they're able to keep up to date very easily with what's going on in the classroom with the student, which is really important. I wanted to plug this one program that focuses on families. Um, it's by Gerald Mahoney and James McDonald, and it's called Responsive Teaching. And it's a program particularly for young children, um, but it focuses on training parents how to help support their children and develop skills. And it works on pivotal behaviors behaviors that the children need to learn in order to learn, rather than teaching them uh, discrete skills like how to produce R, or how, uh, a vocabulary, or colors, or those kinds of discrete uh, skills. And the research on this program is fantastic. It's just really wonderful about um, how superior it is to some of our um, existing preschool programs or pull-out speech programs and those sorts of things. So I just wanted to plug that in. Abby, did you want to make any comments on the, on the support, sir? I saw you and your mom talking there. Mm -hmm. um, I think I liked, uh, I also liked the, the preschool. Mm -hmm. Oh, that they have, Oh, what's I think Abby's a little confused. Um, what we were talking about earlier is she was never bullied in school, to your point, Jill. Um, the students were really pretty um, respectful and accommodating and um, involved her as much as any other student. Yeah, thanks. That's what I've seen. Um, accommodations are another support, and this is uh, this is how I usually explain what goes on in the general education classroom. You know, the teacher has a curriculum to teach, and she has activities, whether it's a reading group or a, a worksheet or a project for the students. And for most students, they can participate in that activity and learn the goals and skills that are in the curriculum. So they just go straight down here. For our students with mild disabilities or learning disabilities, um, they can, they can um, uh, participate in the activity maybe with some accommodations and they can also learn the curriculum. And that's where we get our higher graduation rates because they get those accommodations they need to learn the curriculum. And then we have some students that really uh, participate in the activity and they might have accommodations, but they also have different goals in the, in the curriculum and in, the, in that activity. And I think I have an example right away. Uh, it's coming up in just a second, but I'll share with you about that. Um, one of the accommodations that you see all the time are just simple things like pencil grips and slant boards to improve writing uh, posture. You can see this little girl, she almost looks like she's um, having trouble seeing the paper, but that wasn't the issue at all. She just needed to have the proper pencil grip and she needed to have a better placement of the paper and change her posture and she's writing quite well. Just, you know, giving these kinds of accommodations and equipment to the teachers uh, can solve many of the uh, problems that we used to pull the kids out for. Color coding is a, a big one. You can take uh, colored tape and put it on uh, the main idea and supporting details in a paragraph. Um, one of the nice things about this tape is that when the teacher goes over to check how, how the child has done on the, the project of identifying the main idea and supporting details, if they're not correct, they can just pull the tape off and replace it and correct the answer. So they can work on that. But color coding is, is still a really great queuing system for kids with disabilities. Graphic organizers. Abby, did you use any graphic organizers, pictures, picture maps to learn to learn concepts? No, I didn't. This one, ha if this one shows, yeah, this one happens to be um, on geography, but the idea is that you can 
you can add pictures and words and get this visual of the concept you're trying to teach students. In this case, we're trying to teach students that geography is made up of things, people, and places. And so you can use pictures, you can use words. But what's really clever, and I think it'll come up here in just a second, is we can click on this and it will go to a written outline where the student can actually write the report. So first they develop it here, and then they go and then they produce an outline and a written report. I think it's going to be in it. It's one of my favorite pieces of software. It's called Inspiration. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Abby wishes we had that when she was in school. Mm -hmm. She did? No, we wish she had. Oh, she wish she had. Yeah, it's just the coolest software. And it's in Spanish, too. Now, let's see. I think it's going to click over to the... Okay. So, here, it comes up with this outline. Now, unfortunately, I didn't write any words on that sample. I just had the places, things, and people. But um, uh, it would have any of the words that we put on there, like home and school, if I had written, if I had written the words on there. So, very clever program. This is Curtis. And... Uh, Curtis has uh, Williams syndrome, and um, writing was very difficult for him. And these these are his own words. He was and this is an example. Um, he was saying writing is so hard for me, and the make, making changes takes so long. Uh, I can't even erase what I want to. And sometimes when I try to read it again, I'm not even sure what it says. So here was Curtis working for years and years and years on improving his handwriting um, when really what he needed was a word processor, a text-to-speech word processor. And as soon as he got that, he could do all his work in his classroom. That doesn't happen as much anymore because people are so into technology. But there still is that feeling sometimes that kids need to, to uh, learn to write the words rather than just start out typing them. It's a very good script. This is another piece of software that's fantastic. This is called Clicker 7 software. And this one happens to be an Arabic example, but it's a talking word processor. So whatever I would type into it, it would talk. And um, you can make programs with it. So in this case, this is, I have to choose which verb I want. The boy is painting, uh, swimming, or jumping, whatever it says in there. Right there. So I, have, I just click on it, and I can create the sentence. So that's kind of a program for kids. But it also is a talking word processor. It's also in Spanish, and here's another little learning activity. And every classroom should have the clicker software. Every classroom. The special ed teachers can make so many programs on this for the kids to target their particular goals. Another software that's really important for support is this board maker software. It makes all of the pictures and graphics that are used on communication boards and learning materials. And this is my example of having a different goal for a child. This is Josh. Josh has autism. It's kind of clear to see because he doesn't want his shoes on, and he has his fingers in his ears in the gym class. So he's pretty, pretty identifiable as a kid with autism there. Um, in class, because he's not at grade level, he's not learning all the things in the curriculum that the other students are learning. When they're working on weather, he was learning on um, concepts like hot and cold. So here he is sorting pictures of cold things and hot things and putting them on a, on a board. One of the things about kids with autism is they really like that tactile uh, feeling of pulling the Velcro off and putting the Velcro on. Um, and so these kinds of learning activities are great for them. Board makers also used to make visual cues for independence for students. So you'll see, you'll see these uh, cues in um, homes and in schools, you know, what do I do first in the morning, how do I set the table, how do I get ready for the bus, how do I pack a book, pack my um, book bag, um, all sorts of sequences to remind kids of the activities they're supposed to do so they can be independent. A lot of people, um, uh, a lot of until recently, a lot of people really struggled with the communication. If you had a child that was nonverbal, um, it was really difficult to get a good communication system. And now there are uh, several really great programs out there. This one's just an example where you click on each one, each one of these pictures. It makes the sentence up there. You, you push return, and it says, it says the word. 
and you can eat, and it has different programs so I can have this page up in the classroom where when the teacher says um, uh, do you want to come to the board and do this problem I can click on yes you know is the answer to this problem six I can click on yes or no very quickly in the classroom and they're programmable you can change the pictures you can change the words you can change the language um, it has several levels with it and they're just fantastic for the kids now that used to carry around cumbersome communication boards and now we have it you know right on the iPad or the simple system we still need some switches and some adaptive things for students who have physical disabilities so they can access all this cool stuff so this one over here is just a switch that I can attach to any table and he can the child can use this switch whether he pushes it with his elbow or with his head or with his knee it doesn't make any difference he can activate whatever equipment he needs to activate and fidgets are another accommodation we have a lot of students who uh, have sensory integration issues and being able to have a fidget in the classroom or have an opportunity to 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 get some sensory input um, really helps them get through the day this was a particularly one this is velcro and one of the teachers i was working with put this under the desk so the child could feel it anytime they wanted to they could just get that sensory input from feeling the velcro that was glued under the desk very clever Another concept I want to give a plug for is positive behavioral support and talking about sensory issues and the supports for that is a good place to do this. We, um, in positive behavioral support, we don't look at rewarding children for the behavior that we would like them to have or punish them. What we do is we look at why is that behavior happening? And what supports do we need to, to put in to help that student? So let's look at these tennis balls up here. Many of our students with autism and other students uh, are very irritated by sounds in the classroom and could never stay in the general education chairs all the time. Rather than giving the child little check marks uh, for every half hour he tolerates being in this noisy classroom, uh, rather than doing that, we make the accommodation of saying, let's eliminate the noise. So let's eliminate the noise. So we just eliminated the, the noise of the squeaking chairs. In this, this classroom is out in Chelsea, Michigan, and this is actually one where the, the teachers have allowed children to choose different kinds of ways to sit or be comfortable. So here you've got a child sitting on one of those bean or um, ear balls, which gives kids some feedback into how their, what their, their body is in terms of their position in space and allows them to sit longer. Last, uh, the last uh, principle here is planning. And if we don't have planning for this inclusion effort, um, it really just becomes personality dependent. I can't tell you how disappointed I was to go to schools work with some teachers that were very excited to do co-teaching and do collaborative teaching and include kids um, in their classrooms. But if one of those teachers moved away, the program, if, um, if, a ch if, if one child with a disability was included with a paraprofessional but another child came along or the paraprofessional left, the child may go back to special ed or the next child that comes along won't get inclusion. So it's really important that there's a district-wide uh, plan for how we're going to implement inclusion. It probably focuses a lot on training people and staffing. Then there's the school-wide planning, which is what I talk about reallocation of resources. Let's get close the special ed rooms and move those resources out into the general ed rooms. And then there's the individual plan. This is an example of a school-wide plan. Um, this is a this is an elementary schedule, and you can see the teachers and speech therapists and paraprofessionals are spread out through the classrooms in order to support students. And this is um, an individual action plan for a student that's included with Down syndrome. And we look at his goals and what accommodations he needs and who's going to support him. And we do that for the whole day. So it could be planning for the for the school level or planning for an individual student but clearly without planning it's just not going to happen it's not going to it's not going to sustain itself 
and that is very sad. Thank you so much, Dr. England. That was excellent information on resources, practices, strategies that can promote inclusive education. And um, we'll, we'll, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm thinking there'll be questions for you as we go along. I'd like to turn to Abby. And um, Abby, I would like to ask you if you could share a bit with us about how you've been included in your community. Sure. I first started by being in the Shem Vui program for babies and, and toddlers. After that, I went to the Amasa Suri School. <clears throat> My parents made sure I was in regular year at two education classes. I joined a Bologna troop and finished in a Girl, Girl Scouts. We had a pool at the club where I, where I took a lessons and was on the swim team. When I was 10, I started taking dance a lessons. I started learning to play Clarinet in sixth grade. In high school, I was in, in band in and choir. I took classes for shadow care in a Brighton. I take dance classes and perform at Washington Community. I call it. <laughs> wow, Abby, you are one one busy gal. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> and you're also a very modest person. And Mike, I don't know. Do you have the slide um, showing all of the? Um, oh, there it is. Uh, Abby, you do so much volunteer work, and I just wanted to highlight that. I don't know, Mike, if we can keep it on this slide for a moment without having it move forward. But sure. Abby, you, and, when, and Dr. England, when you were talking about being helpful, you know, that, I mean, Abby, you have given, you give back to your community um, so much. And just throughout your life, you've been involved in many different volunteer activities, the Humane Society, Food Bank, Safety Town, your a, a counselor, or junior counselor, uh, I'm not sure about the Appalachia Service Project, but um, and then you, this part I do know very well is you give presentations on Down syndrome, and you are part of our faculty uh, in our LEND program. And each year in our LEND program, you have given a lecture, a presentation to our trainees that I know that is considered one of the highlights of the program. So um, thank you for giving back as much, you know, probably much more than you than you got. But we thank you. Um, Luann, I wanted to ask you a question um, in terms of just what efforts you went through to get Abby included in the regular classroom and in other aspects of the community. Okay, thanks. Well, first we became familiar with the law. Um, Abby was born in 1990, and IDEA and ADA were pretty new concepts at that time. And we also became uh, familiar with people who were advocates for individuals with disabilities, uh, including Gerald. It's hard to believe we've known each other 28 years. <laughs> um, my husband and I, review, we viewed Abby through the lens of if she didn't have a disability, what would we do? And we did our best to help Abby become her most able self by augmenting her formal education with school tutors and community-based activities. Um, we learned, I don't know when we learned it, but we figured out that having her participate in community activities provided us examples to reinforce or reference when, in, when educators would imply she wasn't capable. And that's really how we got her in a lot of the programs would, we would point to ways that she was already involved and how capable she was. Thank you, Luann. 
And Abby, I have a follow-up question for you. What are your goals and dreams for the future? My goal is to be a good role model by improving my dance skills mm. and helping preschool children. Great. My dream is to meet a great guy and became an actor. That's great. And Luann, um, my question for you is, how do you continue to support Abby in achieving her goals and dreams? Well, you know, post uh, high school, it's a different thing than when uh, your, one of your children is in, in school. Um, but we've been able to help Abby find work at preschools, which is what she loves doing. And we support her interests like dancing and we try to find opportunities where she and others see herself as capable and contributing. And I can speak about your dancing, Abby, having seen it firsthand. You are a beautiful dancer. And one of the resources we're going to share is a link to the what, a dance that you did at your recital where you choreographed, you selected the music, you choreographed. It is a beautiful, beautiful video. And um, I'm just, I'm perfectly blown away by your dancing skills. So um, to hear that you're continuing that. And mm -hmm. you know, if I just wanted to open it up for an opportunity for Dr. England and Abby and Luann, if you want to, if there are any questions you have for each other. I, I don't. I, I will have to say that, Jill, uh, what you provided in terms of information is, is really vital and important. And thank you for your work. Thank you. And uh, I'm just curious, Luann, in terms of the things that you saw in, in Jill's slides of some of the strategies, were there some that you mentioned one that you wished you had? Were there ones that, that you did have that you thought were really good that, that you might speak to? Well, you know, we didn't have uh, co-teaching in the classrooms, but Abby did have a parapro. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, the parapro, um, we advocated for the parapro to be assigned to the classroom, and that really helped because having a parapro right next to the child kind of stigma, stigmatizes them a little bit in the classroom, especially as they get older. The parapros can interfere with the socialization and learning process. So, um, no, I mean, I just, uh, I think any school, well, I, I will say one thing in my closing remark here with respect to Jill's uh, presentation is that she's absolutely right. If one child is included and the rest are not, the school doesn't really practice inclusion. That's personality specific and it shouldn't be that way. And. I wanted just to open it up now if there are questions from, I saw one question in the chat box. You can certainly do that, but. Uh, as Sharon mentioned, there was one uh, that Michelle posted in the chat. Um, I think it's for Jill. Um, she's looking for ideas for working with a special ed teacher who owns her students in her class to support increased inclusion for a student with complex supports um, in, gen in the general education setting. Um, and then the second part to that was any other similar book recommendations about responsive teaching. Uh, the one that was mentioned is $192 on Amazon. So I think they're just looking for some other books <laughs> as well. For uh, the Mahoney Responsive Teaching, there's a lot of articles online, so you can, you can probably find information printed. Uh, he, did, he wrote a lot of articles, but uh, let me know if you need some help with that. And I'll see if I can find some resources on responsive teaching. So the other question is, we've got a special ed teacher who owns her students, which means she really feels that she's responsible for their learning and they'll fail if they leave? Yes. Yeah. Well, and, and um, the, uh, I have been advocating um, for quite, quite a long time trying to increase general support uh, inclusion. But um, there's sort of this, the, an older, how I consider an older model of thinking that um, special ed um, is a program that students belong in rather than, in a, in a place rather than um, uh, a service. So I'm just looking for ideas and, and uh, for students that have high and complex support needs, 
Well, a couple of thoughts. One is I, 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 um, I really hate it when I use the term more mild disabilities because if a child's struggling with a learning disability, they can be struggling as difficult as any student. But yeah. just as it, to make this point, um, it's interesting that most of the teacher, general ed teachers have a harder time including a student with a learning disability than they do a youngster with a more visual disability who's not at grade level. And it, it, the reason I think is that when you have a student with a learning disability who has some skills, the teacher thinks, I should be able to teach him to read. I should be able to teach him to write. You know, what's wrong with me? Because I can't teach this child because they can't see the learning disability. And they really struggle with that. They really struggle. Where if I include a child with a uh, more visual, let's just say a child with Down syndrome who's not going to be at grade level, um, then they can, okay, they sort of relax and they go, okay, so um, we're going to pick out things we're going to teach this child and that's going to be fine. He, I don't have to have her learn third grade curriculum, you know. So, um, but for in terms of the teacher ownership, you've got to you've got to ask the school to to send that person and a group of people or a team to places to visit to see how it's done. They have to get it. They have to they have to talk with their peers, and they have to actually see how it works. Then if they're still resistant, I, I had a uh, up in Bay City one of the uh, first teachers we worked with a special ed teacher who ended up then supporting in the regular classroom, and her classroom got closed. One day she was walking down the hall, and two of her former students were behind, or at least one of her former students was behind her. And the friend said to the student, why don't you go in that room anymore like you used to? And the kid said, I don't need special education anymore. Now the special ed teacher was walking in front, so she, she actually started to cry. They don't need me anymore. Which, of course, wasn't true at all because she was in the regular ed classrooms helping the students. But to her, this, so I'm t for special ed teachers who have their own classroom and their own coffee pot and students who bring them Christmas presents every year, it is really difficult. Um, I think you have to start by visitations to successful programs have them go and look and have them talk to teachers. You could have somebody come present. I mean, you could have a team of teachers come and talk, uh, but probably a small group going out somewhere and then coming back with the ideas and saying, oh, this is really working. And, you know, Some of the biggest resistors, uh, well, the biggest resistors to inclusion are the special ed people because of that ownership issue. Um, I found general ed to be really easy to work with, but, um, um, some of the biggest resistors who believe kids can only learn in their classroom end up being the best supporters of inclusion. It's really interesting. They're so convinced it won't work, but if they give it a shot, then they're just as convinced it will work. Yeah. So, but I would start with visits. I would I would talk to your principal and or your director actually and say let's let's get some visits and find out how people are making this work. Okay, I have a question for you, Addy. Um, when you were in school, did you have a favorite subject? I did. <clears throat> My favorite subject in school has to be uh, has to be bio partially and band. Mm -hmm. Me too. Two of these. <laughs> And another question, um, I, you know, I know you're a very um, advanced in your dance. Do you have a favorite form of dance that you do? Uh, that is a good question. I also like a ballet, a modern, and some, yeah, probably some hip hop. Cool. And you mentioned that you're taking jazz, a jazz dance class, your first one, correct? Yes, I am. Mm -hmm. right. It's exciting. Any other questions before we, um, and Jill, I didn't uh, mean to cut you off before. Was there anything that you, I, did you feel like you were able to get your key points across? Yeah, I, I could have done another 50 slides. <laughs> you know, that's the good news is there's so many examples of success out there. Um, so that's the good news. How right. we, how we get some of these schools to turn around and, 
she's asking if, if you approach, um, you know, being involved in your community the same way perhaps you did um, when you're in school or in, at Washtenaw uh, and being involved on the campus or being involved in other activities at school. Oh, you know, I would have to say yes in many ways. Um, we volunteer, Abby and I both volunteer for the Appalachia Service Project, which is down in Kentucky for one week during the summer. Um, she also does a lot of presentation on Down syndrome to different groups. Um, we are going to, um, oftentimes I help to like mentor her, uh, like when it's the first time that she's going to do something. But we're going to be involved with Selkra, like the Daddy Daughter Dance, and helping there. And Abby's going to start volunteering for Special Olympics as signing some people in and, you know, helping kids that need help and things like that. Okay, thank you. And I can see that Amy had commented that her mic wasn't, isn't working. So hopefully that was answered her question. I am going to um, stop now and thank our three presenters for just a wonderful information. And Mike, if you can go um, pull up the slides and we'll tell you about the resources we have. We have a list of um, resources here. Um, Jill and Dr. England have gave us a long list of um, inclusive education resources, so long that we couldn't fit it on a slide. And so um, Mike will be um, sharing a copy of that, those resources. We also have um, a link to Abby's possibilities video, really worthwhile seeing, and we have a whole series. Um, I'm gonna give a plug for our whole series of possibilities um, videos that I hope you will um, check out. Also, we have the link to Abby's solo dance recital, which is just absolutely beautiful. We, um, there are some resources around inclusive education and inclusive communities on the Intelligent Lives website. So we've listed that as well as the MyDDI website. So I am going to hand it off to you, Mike, to close us out. Again, thank you to our presenters. Um, it was just wonderful information. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, all the resources, including these links, I'll include in an email um, following the conclusion tonight, either uh, later tonight or tomorrow morning. I'll send this off to everyone who was logged into the session tonight. Um, for those of you who are seeking the One Social Work uh, Continuing Education Credit, these are your instructions for how to do that. And I will also include this in the email, but I'll leave this slide up for a minute here so folks can, um, can write uh, down what they need to. Um, so you'll send your check to uh, my DDI before, by February 1st. After February 1st, uh, that'll be the cutoff. And then um, uh, uh, related to that, uh, after February 1st, we'll also post a recording of the session tonight so that uh, the session can be viewed um, after that date. Okay. Um, and and my, oh yeah, go ahead. I just want to make sure that people understand that the CE is only if you've listened live tonight. Yes. Yeah, uh, the, one of the stipulations uh, from the School of Social Work at Wayne State is that you participate in the live session. So only those who are logged on tonight are eligible. And then our next and our fourth in the series uh, of the special interest forums will be on March 21st. Again, another Thursday, a third Thursday from 5 to 6 p.m. Um, and we'll have uh, another guest panel discussing inclusion, uh, inclusive programs and inclusion in higher education for students with developmental and intellectual disabilities. Uh, and again, that'll be online through Zoom. And if you signed up for this session tonight, you're, you will be included on in our mailing list for the uh, flyer and the announcement for the uh, forthcoming sessions as well. Okay. Um, if, if you have any questions, you can send an email to myself, uh, the email at the bottom of the slide, uh, or to our general uh, ddi at wayne.edu email. Um, and if you have any questions uh, about how to access this after February 1st, you can also email me. So without further ado, I think we're at right around six o'clock. So Sharon, if you have anything else. No, just uh, thank you everyone for joining us. We hope to see you on March 21st for our next uh, forum. Thank you again to our speakers and have a nice evening.